So how do you get the most from your short-term rental investment? Or how do you launch a business where you make money on short-term rentals? Look, one good, a friend of mine is 38 years old and she literally lives um, off Airbnb income. That's, that's what she does. She's retired at 38. So how do you do that? How do you manage short-term rentals? What's the inside information to get into the industry to actually uh, be able to succeed? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So welcome to the show. With us today is Colin Tate. Now he's a serial entrepreneur, owner and host of eight Airbnb properties, Airbnb ambassador, short-term rental coach, author of host coach, and speaker as well. Now, his mission is to share his experience, knowledge of specific tools and software that he uses, and the systems he has created to harness the unique opportunity of short-term rental investing so the others can enjoy a life of financial freedom uh, to live their way. So, Colin, thanks for coming on with us today. Absolutely, Ty. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited that you are here. Um, and give me some insight. I mean, from your perspective, why is now such a great time to get into the short-term rental investing industry? You know, Ty, like your friend, um, I was at a crossroads uh, back in 2018 where I had sold a company and scratching my head thinking about what uh, I was going to do next. I had a couple of Airbnb uh, rentals at the time, but that summer I ended up picking up three more which uh, really allowed me to hone my systems and really test things and test tools and approaches to start to dial in on the processes that we, uh, we talk about and teach today. So how did you do through COVID? I'm curious because there was a time where like Airbnb, I thought was for the most part, like really shut down. So like, how, how did, how was that? And the reason I asked that is because that's worst case scenario, right? I mean, from what I can look at with your industry, you just went through worst case scenario. So, so what happened? How did that look through the COVID cri- or through the crisis or through the pandemic, I should say? Yeah. Airbnb and the whole short term rental industry rose out of COVID like a phoenix. So we had two tough months where uh, short term rentals were restricted to no, um, no less than 30 days. So we did a quick pivot there and brought in some renters on a 30 day basis. A lot of people, you know, trying to flee from New York and states like that. But in the aftermath, it has fundamentally changed the way people work and travel. That's interesting. What what do you mean by that? It used to be where, you know, vacation rentals were always a great, you know, summertime um, vacation spot. They're great weekends. But with post-COVID, people are really tired of looking at their same four walls. So we get a lot of real robust demand for what we call the work away or leisure travel uh, demand. That makes a lot of sense. I was, um, I travel a lot. I was in the Bahamas literally the weekend uh, that Atlantis opened. And like you said, I was just back there like a week ago and it's, this place is slammed. It's like February. Like it's not spring break. There's no reason that everybody should be out, but the place is slammed. So I've seen that as I travel, just people are so eager to get out there. So it's like, it seems like you had a real short term where you didn't do a lot and then it just blew up and it's probably just sounds like just been a crazy year to your sense. Yeah, it, it's, it is fundamentally, it was always a very, very good, strong cash flowing business. And it's just a white hot hype, white hot opportunity now post COVID. So uh, when we talk about, is, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was say the stat is, um, the average U.S. Uh, Airbnb host is up something like 75% from 2020 to 2021. I've read similar stuff. Like it's this massive increase with what you guys are used to dealing with. When we talk about short-term rentals for our audience, what are we talking about here? We're talking about um, any type of getaway place, um, cabins, on um, the, any place near really. Where do people in the U.S. pick any city in the U.S.? And there's there's a destination from 50 to 500 miles away where people like to get out and get away. Mountains, lakes, rivers, the ocean, winery areas. Where are people craving to get out of the city and spend a little time relaxing? Those all make ideal investment opportunities. So you buy properties in areas that kind of have high vacation type traffic. Like, so for example, my friend who I opened the show talking about, she's all in Panama City. So Panama City is where she owns all of her properties because like that's a high, you know, tourist destination. And it's uh, when we're filming this right now, it's just the beginning of March. She's booking stuff out June and July in those areas. So is that what you're talking about is buying a property in like a high tra- vacation type area and then renting it out for short term, typically through Airbnb? That's exactly correct. And the only caveat I would put to that is I 
I coach a lot of um, clients and, you know, often they'll ask, where is the best investment to make? The beach is, is fundamentally always a good vacation market, but it's also priced as such in terms of comparable real estate, um, you know, in buying the houses. There's an even better ROI in trying to find places that have historically been just family getaway spots as opposed to historic um, where the, uh, the beach rentals are, are baked into the comparable price of the sale price for the real estate. Yeah, and that's what she's dealing with now too, to your point is uh, bought a bunch of them years ago, right? She can't find anything now. She's looked in Panama City multiple times, looked at it, everything's so inflated price-wise. It just doesn't make any sense. So she's exactly what you said, looking at places like Tennessee with cabins and things uh, like that, where the market's a little bit better. Exactly. You know, and the market property values are up, you know, 20, 30%. But as we've talked about before, you know, also the flip side of that is the demand and the, the revenue side of a short-term rental is up, you know, in excess of that. Why short-term rental versus long-term rental? You know, everybody in real estate has their sort of favorite asset class, but the, the cash flow is so strong in short-term rentals um, compared to a, a long-term rental. You know, I, I had a couple of condominiums that I rented out. First of all, I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't passionate about it. I was, you know, unhappy when a tenant would call with a clogged toilet or, or something broken. With a short-term rental, it's, you know, besides the, the cash flow, which is immensely huge, it's really a, a factor of enjoyability, right? Being passionate about finding that real estate class that you're passionate about, that you don't mind going and spending some time. We love to take the opportunity to spend time in our short-term rentals. And a lot of asset classes, you know, say multifamily, I'm not sure that people feel that same way about you typically rent them through Airbnb or is there other sources as well? Sure. There's lots of uh, what we we'll call OTAs, online um, travel agencies, Airbnb, VRBO, booking.com. Some people even set up websites and take bookings themselves. Um, I generally teach it's best to be the master of one, focus on one platform. Um, you know, these algorithms work just like any other type of search engine, and they're going to reward the listing with a higher placement based on you know how you perform for that company right uh you prefer airbnb versus brbo i'm an airbnb guy i think they're gonna they've got the metrics to win in the long term i think if you ask you know anybody over under 30 what verbo is they might not be able to answer so clearly that makes sense um you have pillars that you talk about of short-term rental investing so what are they? What are the pillars that you kind of look at that are essential to get into short-term investing to really have financial freedom? Yeah, it really does fall, fall into those four pillars, those four buckets. Um, and they'll just run through all four and then we can dive in uh, where you see fit. The first is um, find your where. The second is make it pop. The third is price for occupancy. And the fourth is rank for authority. What did you say the fourth was? Rank for authority. And so let's dive into a little bit of those, if you don't mind. Uh, when you talk about first to begin with the where, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about finding one in kind of, you know, family vacation destinations that might not be the popular ones you think about. Do you typically recommend people stay close to where they are? Um, like, do I in Florida, Tampa here, where do I want to be looking over in L.A., for example, or in Austin, Texas? You know, it is possible to manage remotely. I actually lived uh, with my family about two years ago in Athens, Greece, managing, you know, six or seven properties at the time. So it is possible to be remote, but I generally coach people when you're first starting out, let's start somewhere within a couple hours drive that you can spend some time there. You're going to want to spend a little time setting the property up and enjoying, um, you know, setting it up and getting to know the area so that you're passionate about it and you can share it. And that comes across as an experience you know, just in how you describe your listings, how you communicate with your guests, you know, it comes across to the guest when you care more than, you know, than you care more than the, the paycheck. Yours that you own, are they all over the place or do you typically tend to buy in one area because it's easier to build a maintenance team in one area? Because that's what, for example, my friend says, try to stay in Panama City. I'm like, why don't you come like, down to Tampa? You live in Tampa. So because and my whole team's up there, right? The handyman's <laughs> up there, the plumber's there. Like she has a whole team that built up there already. And the difficulty of finding all those people, testing those people from afar. So how do you, how do you look at it? How do you, you teach and how do you handle it? How do you teach your students? 
Um, I'm, I'm very focused in one county in the Blue Ridge Mountain, the Shenandoah River area. And as I have, you know, a lot of people give me that advice. Well, why don't you, you know, why don't you look on the other side of the mountain or why don't you look somewhere else? Um, I'm actually becoming more and more focused. I'm actually focusing when I'm making acquisitions, I just uh, put in a contract in specific neighborhoods. So we're, I'm, I'm going just not only from say a county level, but there's two or three neighborhoods that my investments are, are focused on. And I'm continuing trying to focus on putting more in those neighborhoods for the same reasons you, you, you mentioned, Ty. You know, focus you know, yourself when you're getting around and having to you know, maybe drop off some supplies or drop off some, some new decor. Focus for your housekeeper, your handyman, your whole team. Yeah, it makes sense if one crew can manage all of the different properties. And I like how you said you're even focusing on neighborhoods because with that kind of niche, it's really easy to know what to look for. And when something comes available to grab it and easy to probably get to know the real estate agents that handle that county you and then it. get them to come to you with pocket listings and such. And, and to know the numbers, you know, I bought a place in a neighborhood that I have a focus on and it came to me as an off market deal. So you kind of get, you know, people say, how do you find off market deals? That's always a big question in real estate get known in an area and literally, you know, the phone will ring, you know, I sold, uh, I bought a property from, from a couple and they employed a young man and he called me one evening and said, I'm thinking about selling my house and was telling my boss and they gave me your phone number and I bought it off market and needed a little work, but I knew that that neighborhood would perform. So when you're looking for a property, what do you look for? Um, just like in real estate, you know, we, we want to start with some bit of curb appeal, right? People, from the outside, you know, it's a little harder to change things on the outside than it is the inside. So some bit of curb appeal. And then um, inside, in terms of a decorating, you know, if you look through Airbnb listings, people want something a little nicer than their house. So we try to keep the decor very crisp, very clean, very welcoming. We, it, we're in cabins, so we try to say no dead animals or doilies or grandma's, grandma's quilts. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, what about, you know, buying them? You, you might be in a situation position, I don't, I don't know, where you buy them cash. Now that's what my friend does, right? She just comes in and buys some cash so she can get in and grab the deal. But I'm sure a lot of your students getting into this don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash laying around. So how do you recommend somebody get the money they need to kind of break into this? Obviously, cash is king, and that's a great way to win deals. Um, a lot of people have equity in their homes right now, right? There's been a lot of home appreciation. I think I bought my first one with uh, a home equity line of credit. It's also popular, particularly for people getting started, to partner up with someone, right? There's lots of um, people that have capital and are interested in this, but don't necessarily have the time or energy. And then there's you know people that have the time and energy and don't have the capital. So um, getting started, a good way to do that is to find you know find that part that you don't have and partner with someone. Yeah, and I often talk about that, that so many people are surprised that there's people that have the money, they want to get a rate of return, they just don't want to do the work, and they're looking for the people like this that are willing to do the work. Uh, one of your pillars is make it pop. Well, what does that mean? You know, that's about the decor. That is about the things we talked about, you know, fresh paint, fresh amenities, and really the, the, the final piece to making it pop is professional HDR photography. If you look through, you know, some Airbnb listings, you'll see dark photos, you'll see, you know, poor photos and people are buying. Think about it for a minute. They never, you know, when, when you show a house, you, you know, you go see that house. When you book an Airbnb property, you're buying off the photos. So you should invest, you know, in those high quality photos. And generally that's, you know, a $300, but that is a big investment to make it pop out, to get that click that the other listing's not getting to drive yourself to the top of the search engine. I'm shocked about that. We go to, for example, Utah every every uh, winter with the kids, and uh, you know it's I don't know, six ten thousand dollars for the week. And I'm shocked when I look at properties because, for example, now this is just me and subjectively, yeah. right? Is that my kids? I take Xboxes because they like to play their game systems. So I look for every room to have a TV, and it's just shocking to me of how I can't tell that from pictures, and it's not in the listing, and how many I pass on. Just because of that, I don't want to message the host to ask the question. Like if, if I can't see from your pictures, you have a TV in the room or don't, and you don't say it in the listing, I pass and move on to the next one. So just that's just me with one little detail I look for. But I love the people, like you said, with professionally done pictures of all angles of the rooms so I can actually see that stuff. Like what's the bed size? 
Another thing I see in Airbnb rentals is they don't have that little at that little part that tells you like an overview of what room or what beds are in each room. Like my kids always stick me in the smallest bed, right? And I don't like to sleep in bunk beds, man. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, that's a good point. But you know, make use of the captions, right? Uh, that for the photos, you could really use that real that uh, that space. And you know, that's a great idea for people listening. How much does a Xbox cost on Facebook Marketplace, right? I, I might have to run out and buy a few from my cabins. Yeah, I mean, it's very true. And believe it or not, like I've chosen places based on that too, the game systems, the stuff that's there. And I'm interested in properties, especially down here, right? Close to Disney. You know, I've, I've been into so many Airbnbs there and they have all these, you know, that take the garage, right? And then they make the garage into like foosball and stuff that's stupid cheap to do. But man, that's a big selling point to me because like my kids, I look like a hero. I walk in and then there's like all these little games and game systems and stuff. I just look like a hero. So you're right. It's just little things in the professional pictures that sell me all the time on what I get. And, and for a host that can make the difference between, 8,000 a month and 10,000 a month by having those ping pong tables or uh, Xbox, you know, people, people are willing to spend these days. Um, you know, again, that's back to the COVID thing. People had budgets that, you know, they're not going to Europe, you know, they're not maybe going to the Caribbean, they're falling back to maybe Disney or, you know, some of these vacation rental spots and they're a little less price insensitive. Um, so people are willing to spend on some of those amenities, spend it, spend on the property. You know, there's a higher end property that might be five, $600 a night because they've listened to their customers and have those amenities. Yeah. And I was asking my friend that she's going through a rehab and ever property. And I said, like, why are you going through that? Put the cost in. She said, because this one I rehabbed and you know, she gave me the stats. It was like ridiculous of increase of money she gets in. Like, I mean, 60 days, it pays for the whole rehab of what she went through in that unit. Um, But again, I'm really shocked at people that just don't put that level of detail in or take crappy pictures that you can't even tell what's going on. But you know what, Ty, and and to bring it back to the listeners, that's the opportunity. So I get the question a lot of times, you know, well, I've heard Airbnb is really hot. Is it too late? It's not. There's a lot of people in it, but there's a lot of people in it that aren't doing it as well as they could. And that's when I got kind of, that's why I started doing what I do. Um, That's why I started to coach because there's so much opportunity. We can add so much value so easily by doing some of these, these small, taking some of these small steps that most hosts are not taking. You mentioned what willing are people, people are willing to pay. You also mentioned that price is part of one of your pillars. How do you go about figuring out what the price? Do you trust Airbnb's recommendation? Do you have a formula used above and beyond that? I do. So there's one of the things that uh, Airbnb has done well is they've really opened their data through uh, API to some third-party vendors. And the one that I recommend for pricing is called Price Labs. And it works a lot like uh, you know airlines price seats. It knows, this software knows from Airbnb specifically what the demand is for any given day and what the occupancy and the availability of the uh, other units available in that market are. And from a base price that you provide, it then calculates a premium or a discount for those nights. So for example, next Tuesday night, you know, might be $250, but 4th of July weekend or two weekends from now might be five, $600 a night. And that was a real, that was one of the first things that I learned when I'd said a little earlier, I, I bought a few extra properties and was experimenting using a third party dynamic pricing tool like Price Labs. There's others, there's Wheelhouse, uh, there's Beyond Pricing, but these algorithms really are one of those key differentiators that allow you to go from, you know, five, $6,000 a month to seven, $8,000 a month on a property. Yeah, that's interesting. And I see that too. Uh, when I go to Utah, for that week in it for Christmas, literally it's the worst week to go. It's $800. And if I choose February for that exact same place, right. it's 200 bucks. And I mean, that's no exaggeration. Like that's legitimately two to $800 a night for the exact same place. And you know, that's, that's, that's called revenue management, right? That, uh, that host is doing a good job. He's getting the value, you know, for, for that property for, for that weekend. So if I'm new to Airbnb, I don't have credibility. I don't have reviews. They like that. That's what helps me get ranking. Well, what are some ways to kind of hack into the algorithm and be able to kind of get the rank authority? You know, it does. It starts with those photos we talked about. It starts with your pricing. Um, it also really is driven by occupancy. So a lot of hosts will get started 
and they'll set a base price and, and they won't fill their calendar. But if you are willing to adjust your prices down sort of in the near term, uh, which I, I always keep an eye on like the next say 15 days, if you're willing to adjust your price down and take a little lower rate, you'll keep your calendar full. And that really teaches the algorithm that you're able to close that sale, right? If they're gonna show you, they're gonna put you in front, you know, top of the pile, then if you can close that sale, you know, it's, they're an economic animal as well, right? They, they receive their, their service fees, both from the host and the guest. Um, but if you can prove that you're able to close those sales by keeping your occupancy full, you'll rise to the top. And, you know, you mentioned um, as part of this, for example, being a super host. I, and that's something I, I just thought of, not that you'd mentioned, but when we talk about the algorithm, I, I'm pretty sure it's a super host on, on Airbnb. How, how do you get that designator? Is there, is that just take the time? Are you just doing what you, you're said to do over time? Or how do you, how do you get that accomplished? Super is pretty straightforward. Um, it's just really trying to align guest needs with, with host behaviors. So you need a certain number of reviews. Um, you need to keep your review rating over 4.7, 4.8. And you need to not cancel on guests. So cancellation is a, is a big part of that. But as long as you're minding your P's and Q's there, it's pretty uh, straightforward to get to superhost status uh, within 90 days. What are some things that you, you teach your students about being able to get good reviews? Deliver a great customer experience, right? So communication to the guests, you know, I provide um, a welcome set of welcome emails um, when they book and then right before, you know, just pointing out, it's back to saying being passionate about your area. Along the way, here's our favorite place to stop for, you know, barbecue or, or there's these apple cider donuts that are on the way and everybody stops and loves them. So taking those extra hospitality steps along the way um, in terms of communications. And then when they arrive, absolute number one thing is spotless level of cleanliness. So your housekeepers become your major, most important business partner. When people walk into a property and it's less than perfectly clean, then they start to see other things. Sure. When it's sparkling clean, they tend to overlook, you know, something small that, you know, a loose doorknob or something, for example. Yeah, it's just so interesting. Like little things like soap and shampoo, right? And mm -hmm. conditioner, that's a big deal to me. Like, I mean, I literally, that stuff affects my, the review. Well, I don't leave bad reviews, even if people do a bad job. Because like, I'm a business right. owner, I understand the right. impact. But I won't leave you a review. Like, if you upset me, like, that's my that's my way of getting back. So I just won't <laughs> leave you a review, right? That's how I do things. But we and like to call somebody, it surprise and delay, you know? So if the, you show up and there's those extra shampoos and maybe some biscotti or, you know, some popcorn. Or I've got a, I've got a client who's got a real nice fire pit and they leave out a little s'mores kit for their guests. Surprise and delight. Yeah, it, it is. It's those little things, those little surprises that I just think are, are so cool that, like you said, especially when you walk in and you see that stuff, like you walk in, you see a little s'mores kid, hey, enjoy it. There's a fire pit, all that. I'm like, wow, right? And then from there, your mind's already in a wow status. So like you have, it takes a while to bring me back down. But like you said, if I come in and it's less than perfect, then I'm like, eh. And then I saw so I get exactly what you're saying. Then I'm like looking around my brain by default for like stuff that's bad. Right. right. You got to think, you know, people have been traveling and they got to, car full of kids and you know you want to walk in and and hopefully that change of environment is a positive change of environment right you know people are often stressed after being after traveling and either you walk in and and you're pleasantly surprised and it changes you know changes the mood or you know if things aren't great then it changes the mood for the worse what about tech stack well what are some other uh tools that you found that are helpful in in running an airbnb uh, empire yeah, you know, from an operations perspective, um, you know, Price Labs, the third-party dynamic pricing tool. We use an automated messaging tool uh, called Hospitable. A lot of people will mention that uh, is, is an Airbnb rental, you know, is it passive, is it active? You know, the guest messaging can be automated through Hospitable. So 90% of my communications with guests is, you know, we say <laughs> taken care of by the robots, right? So an automated messaging tool. Um, and then from there, the final, the final piece is um, keeping track of your, your listings um, placement with a software we uh, called Rank Breeze. That's interesting. Um, you also mentioned the housekeeping, but what other like, 
service type people do you need to maintain a property from afar? Because I think you live in like Washington, D.C. Your properties are in Tennessee so that you're not going down there to maintain stuff. So who else needs to be like in your um, like circle of people that you're going to rely on to maintain the property? Yeah, my properties uh, are, are in the Shenandoah Valley. It's only about two hours away um, in the state of Virginia. The next most important person is really a good handyman. You know, someone that next level up of fix it uh, between, you know, calling an electrician and between the electrician and the cleaner is just a generic handyman, someone who can tighten a doorknob or replace, uh, you know, a light fixture, that type of smaller stuff. And, and they're pretty easy to find, particularly in rural communities, you know, just uh, go to your local hardware store and they're always a wealth of information. That's how you generally find painters and handymen even plumbers, just go down to the local hardware store and ask them, uh, you know, um, who, who they know and who they recommend, and they'll have a list. Hmm. Colin, I've enjoyed having you on today, uh, and we just scratched the surface, right? I mean, you with your students, Gary, really, really in depth with every single aspect of this process. So for those that are learning, want to learn more about getting into the industry or really actually succeeding in the industry, uh, where can they go? Yeah, uh, my website is hostcoach.co. And there's uh, information there about contacting me direct. Um, the book Host Coach is available on Amazon now for the last three weeks or so. And, and we really detail uh, the whole process from, from start to finish in the book. Thanks again for coming on. This has been uh, very enlightening. Thanks, Ty. So if you're watching this, look, uh, you know, we talk about passive income a lot. You hear about passive income a lot. I got to tell you, like I said, I mean, I have friends, like I said, more than one even, but one always comes to mind when I think about Airbnb, they're retired in their thirties and all they do is live on these properties. As a matter of fact, there's a whole secondary business because not only do they own properties, do a really good job of managing and make money, but then other Airbnb hosts have recognized that. And then she actually gets their business. So I'll just give you an example. She literally bought, uh, sold the property and then the buyer gave her the rental business. So she doesn't <laughs> even have to own the property and still makes 20% like return on just managing the rental. So this is the kind of stuff that Colin teaches, I'm sure a lot of stuff in his training on the advanced techniques and what you can do with really blowing up and, expl and exploding this business. But you can lose a ton of money doing it the wrong way. So if you want to get the tips and tactics to be able to really succeed, make sure you go to hostcoach.co, hostcoach.co. There's a ton of good stuff here. Okay, on top of, and make sure you go to short-term rental advice when you're here because there's like the equivalent of a blog with all kinds of detailed stuff that can help you. You can learn about the coaching program or they can help you through as well. You can get the host coach book right from here as well. Uh, you got to check this out. I mean, this has a lot deeper insight than we've even been able to jump into here. So make sure you visit hostcoach.co. That's hostcoach.co and achieve real financial freedom, which is like you don't have to work. Uh, as you grow this into a real business, if that's what you want to do, or even just create a really cool secondary income, everything you need training wise is provided through host coach. And the next step that gets you started down that path is going to hostcoach.co. So check it out today. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.